so uh, I found a spot in these woods by my apartment. I thought I'd been everywhere here, but uh, I found this spot with a little waterfall. <laughs> it's late at night, it's dark, nobody's here. And yeah, I just kind of like that waterfall noise in the back. It's calming. <laughs> it's nice. Anyway, I want to tell, this is kind of an impromptu idea, because this just happened. Like an hour ago, I had the idea for this episode. I want to tell a little story about women's pro wrestling. So I never thought I would be a pro wrestling fan. <laughs> like, I remember back in, uh, like, the year 2000, at that point, my friend Tim had gotten me into comic books and I had a job at a comic shop. My friend Brad got me into Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You know, I was pretty deep in the nerd hole at this point. I'm just like, you know, man, I sure am into some nerdy shit. So when my cousin told me like, man, you gotta check out wrestling. I was like, dude, get the fuck out of here. Like, I can't be the guy who loves Buffy the Vampire Slayer, who works at a comic shop, and who watches wrestling. Like, give me a fucking break here. <laughs> I have to have something cool about me. But he's like, no, no, there's this guy, The Rock. You just, just watch it one time. You just gotta see this guy, The Rock. And as everybody globally knows now, <laughs> I mean, he's the fucking Rock. He was fucking amazing. And wrestling was nothing like what I expected it to be like. You know, when I watched it as a kid, it was like 80s pro wrestling, Hulk Hogan pro wrestling. Everybody was super muscular and just yelling at each other. Whereas the year 2000, it was kind of a high watermark. It was Stone Cold, it was The Rock, it was this brief period where this guy Chris Kresge was the head writer for WWE and he had actual like storyboards. You know, he had plots planned out. He wasn't just winging it. That did not last. <laughs> Wrestling traditionally always winged it and after his tenure went back to winging it. But in the year 2000 wrestling was legitimately really good and I became a wrestling guy and it's like well whatever fuck it. <laughs> you know? Who was I kidding anyway? Why try to pretend I'm ever going to be cool? So I watched wrestling for a few years and gradually my friends dropped out one by one. By the end, I mean, literally, I think I was the only one in my friend group still watching wrestling. And then when I moved out west to Vancouver, I didn't have a TV anymore and I just fell out completely. It's like, all right, well, I had my time with wrestling. It was a fun four or five years, but it's over now. But then fast forward a decade and uh, I don't know, I find this happens, I guess that happens to a lot of people. It definitely happens to me that you hit a point where you go back to what you liked when you were young and then you're in forever. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh yeah, I used to love watching wrestling. Oh, I used to love playing Magic the Gathering. Oh, I used to love weird domestic romance manga and anime. <laughs> like just whatever weird thing I used to like when I was like 17. Now I'm like, you know what? Bring it on back, bring it on back. And now I'm never leaving again. I'll just continue to be a fan of this stuff forever. So I started watching wrestling again, even though at that point, like 2014, it actually wasn't that good anymore. <laughs> you know, WWE had had a monopoly for a long time and they just weren't putting their back into it anymore. <laughs> you know, it was like cruise control, but I'm like, ah, well, it's still fun to watch, you know, pyro go off and a big entrance video. And just the very idea of having a cool song play as you strut out to the ring. It's like, that's pretty cool. And I always liked wrestling just because I'm not into normal sports because I just can't get past the us versus them mentality of it. I just, that doesn't work for me. I don't care. I mean, it's way more legitimate. It's an actual competition, but my brain doesn't care. Whereas wrestling is just telling a story. It's completely on the table at this point that wrestling is not a real fight. You know, it's two people working together to tell a story that's not even remotely realistic. <laughs> you know, I remember like one of my friends when he was a kid and he thought wrestling was real. So his mom pointed out to him, like, okay, well, look at this. This one muscle man has the other muscle man in the corner, 
and just punched him in the head 10 times. He just punched him right in the face 10 times. But that guy who got punched, he doesn't have any bruises. He's not cut. There are no injuries on him whatsoever. How do you explain that? And my friend was like, mom, you don't get it. It's because they're the toughest people in the world. <laughs> and it's like, okay, kid, whatever. But at this point, the way pro wrestling is, is viewed by fans, it's more like, it's like violent ballet, <laughs> you know? Or it's like a fight scene in a movie with no cuts. You know, it's like you're just doing the fight scene live. And when you look at it that way, it's really impressive just in a completely different capacity. It's amazing that you can toss a guy eight feet down through a press table and not kill him, <laughs> you know? There's a remarkable art to looking like you're hurting somebody without hurting them very much. But you know, either you're into it or you're not. It's the same way that no one can explain to me why sports are compelling. If you don't like pro wrestling, I can never explain it to you. You know, either you like it or you don't. But coming back to wrestling all these years later, I really didn't watch it the same way I used to. I, I just kind of watch it out of the corner of my eye. You know, when I'm doing something else, I'll put on wrestling and just keep a vague tally of like, okay, this guy's doing this and this storyline's happening. I might not even have the sound on unless something especially interesting is happening. But the nice thing about that is I can watch lots of wrestling. I can put on any weird thing and just play it in the background and just have a sort of generalized tally of what's happening in wrestling. And the thing that really drew me in when I first came back was women's wrestling. Because women's wrestling in the 90s and 2000s was, it was a bad scene. It was just, let's have a match in a pool of pudding. Or let's have a match where whoever gets stripped down to their lingerie first is the loser. You know, like, I mean, in the 90s especially, you know. But well into the 2000s, they kept up with that shit until WWE turned into more of a PG company and tried to get more family-friendly advertisers, and they finally had to reel back on that shit. And the great thing about the tides finally shifting is it opened the door for women's wrestling in North America to be actual pro wrestling, you know? When it wasn't the pillow fight match anymore, it's like, so uh, what do we do now? I don't know, I guess they'll just have a normal match. I guess they'll just be normal wrestlers like everyone else. And it was so cool, because in particular, I always think of this wrestler, Sasha Banks, who her favorite wrestler was this guy, Eddie Guerrero. And during my first tenure as a wrestling fan, I did get to see Eddie Guerrero one time in Montreal. I got to see him wrestle. And it's like, wow, it really stood out. Like, he is great at this. He is a great pro wrestler. Connects with the crowd, physically amazing. Just the guy was 10 out of 10 pro wrestler. And then I remember in that in-between period when I wasn't watching wrestling, I just remember they put out like a DVD set, like the best of Eddie Guerrero. And I just remember walking around, I was in Vancouver, and I didn't have a TV, and I had no way to watch wrestling, and I had no way to even watch that DVD. But I just remember specifically walking around thinking like, man, Eddie Guerrero's awesome. That guy's just great. And then tragically, he died. And Sasha Banks has this story that Eddie Guerrero was her favorite wrestler, and she went to a live WWE show the day after he died. And because the internet was still relatively new at that time and information just didn't spread as fast as it does now, she had an Eddie Guerrero sign and somebody else in the crowd said like, oh man, did you hear? Did you hear what happened to Eddie? And she had no idea. This little girl at this wrestling show, with a sign she made for her favorite wrestler and she had to learn then and there that he had died the day before. Like, man. That must have been a fucking terrible day. But she always wanted to be a pro wrestler. And the wrestler she wanted to be like was Eddie Guerrero. Because there are examples sprinkled throughout wrestling. Even during the darkest times of women's wrestling, there's always people that stand out that you're like, okay, 
that's an amazing wrestler. She's a great wrestler and she's a great wrestler. They're just not in the right environment. They're just not in the right era to be able to avoid the trappings of just the, the ridiculous pin-up style of women's wrestling that is going on. So Sasha wanted to be like Eddie Guerrero, but there was really no reason to believe she could be Eddie Guerrero. At that point in the mid-2000s, it was all these cheesecake matches. But all she could do was put her head down and charge forward. All she could do is train to be a wrestler and just hope that things changed, hope that things were different. So by the time I started watching again in 2014 and 2015 especially, that old style of women's wrestling had gone away, again mostly just for corporate reasons, mostly just so they could have advertisements for Skittles or whatever on the show. But at the same time, WWE started this developmental league called NXT, <laughs> the next, the next wrestlers. And importantly, it was not run by the old guard. It was run by this guy, Paul Levesque, who had been a big time wrestler. He was named Triple H. But I think not coincidentally, Paul Levesque had three daughters. And I think he saw, you know, the writing on the wall of like, if my kids are going to follow in my footsteps, I can't let them walk into the meat grinder that is pro wrestling for women as it stands. I'm in a position now because I'm in charge of the developmental aspect of the business for WWE. I could elevate the state of women's wrestling. And he's never said that it's because he has three daughters, but I feel like it's not coincidence. I don't know. Like maybe if he had three sons, he wouldn't have tried so hard. But for whatever reason, he did try really hard. And it was like a miraculous turnaround. It was a complete 180. In NXT, women's wrestling was always equal to men's wrestling. And I think around that 2015 period actually exceeded it. The fan reaction, the popularity of the women's matches was oftentimes higher than the men's. And it definitely felt that way for me. I remember specifically Sasha Banks and her opponent Bailey, who had a similar story to Sasha, where like Bailey has this, she still has a school report she wrote when she was a kid about how she wants to be a pro wrestler. And they had both worked their asses off and they'd gotten to this developmental league and they just happened to be there at the perfect time that if it had been the way the developmental stuff used to work, they wouldn't have got a particular second look. If they had gone straight to the main roster of WWE, you know, maybe they wouldn't be doing the pillow fight matches anymore, but they would still be relegated to, ah, uh, you just get a quick little match, you know, midway through the show or whatever. But they happen to be in Paul Levesque's version of NXT, where his philosophy was, everybody's the same. And NXT was obviously a lot smaller than the main roster of WWE. They just did these small shows in front of two or 300 people. But a few times a year, they would do gigantic shows, like as big as any of the big wrestling shows, 15, 16,000 people. And at one of those shows, Bailey versus Sasha Banks was the main event. And I mean, especially with all the wrestling that I watch now, and especially the way that I kind of watch it out of the corner of my eye, you know, it's like, it's a, it's just a, it's a pleasant thing to just have on in the background, but it's like, it's like having a fire going, you know? Uh, most of the time, it doesn't really stick with me. Most of the time, I'm not paying that much attention. But man, that Sasha Banks versus Bailey match, I remember it so clearly. And the crowd was so into it, and it was so energizing, and it was so extra cool, because in this match, Bailey was the good guy, and Sasha Banks was the bad guy, and Sasha Banks was such an asshole, such a fucking dickhead. I remember this one part where Sasha had Bailey like wrenched into this hold and Bailey's trying to reach around to escape and Sasha just starts stomping on Bailey's hand and it was so fucking brutal looking. I was thinking like how how do you fake that? And I had the feeling like I don't think they are faking it. I think because this is such a big match and they just want this to stick in people's minds 
I think Sasha is just stomping Bailey's fucking hand, like, at full force right there. Just to not risk ruining the moment, you know? Like, that's kind of the secret sauce to pro wrestling, is if you really need to make sure a specific moment is, like, indelible in people's minds and that it doesn't come off fake and that it doesn't look like it's not connecting, the secret trick is you can switch to strong style. And strong style just means you fucking hit the person. You just do it. That's always in your arsenal. That's an option. For just a moment, you can make it a real fight because then it's gonna look real. And it looked so fucking real. And I remember having this feeling as I watched it that, you know, as much as I wanted to just take this match as any other match and treat these wrestlers like any other wrestlers and just kind of bask in the equality of it like how crazy is this how crazy is it that wrestling has reached this point that it's a women's main event and everybody's on board and it doesn't seem remotely like how things used to be but it still it felt even better than that knowing First off, knowing these aren't actually enemies, that these are actually friends, and they're putting on this performance for everyone. But secondly, knowing the whole history, knowing what women's wrestling used to be like, and knowing what it must have been like to be Bailey writing that report in school about wanting to be a pro wrestler, to be Sasha Banks idolizing Eddie Guerrero, to imagine yourself in that spot, And to know that there was no actual hope that they were going to get there. You know, the best they could realistically hope for is that they would train and work and struggle for years and years and years and then end up being second-class citizens in the world of wrestling. But they did it anyway. And just through a miracle convergence of everything timing out perfectly and everything coming together, They were the main event, and it was easily the match of the year. Easily. Ironically, as clear as it is in my mind, like, especially that stomp, I can remember it so well, but just, I feel like the whole match is so clear in my mind, except, and I think this is the weird duality of pro wrestling, I am not sure who won. I mean, it must have been Bailey. It had to have been the feel-good ending of good conquering evil. But I would have to go look it up to be certain, because that's not the part that was important. I feel like everything else was what was important. And then the winning and the losing, it's funny, because that's what would have been important. Back in the day when they were trying to pretend that pro wrestling was real, whoever won and whoever lost would have been important. And everything is upside down now. Now that's the least important thing. No one cares. (laughs) It's the performance that's important, and it's what it meant, and it was so amazing, just so excellent. And that's how I felt about women's wrestling in general. I mean, that was the premier kind of peak match, but there was all kinds of matches in NXT, and so much so that when they moved up to the main WWE roster, and there was not just them, there was a whole group of women from that generation, the main roster was always worse than NXT, was always less interesting, was always way more behind the times, but They still did all kinds of great stuff and just elevated women's wrestling to this place that in North America it had never been before. And I guess it's weird to say, as much as it's the equality of it is what makes it great, I guess it's a little weird to say that because they are women, it did make it more important to me. Because wrestling isn't equal. It's not. The world isn't equal. It really did add to these moments and made these things more important. But they would have been great without that, you know? (laughs) If you could just somehow take every wrestler and convert them into featureless blob people that had no genders, the Bailey and Sasha Banks matches would have been match of the year under any circumstance. Eddie Guerrero inspired me to become a WWE superstar. I grew up watching him. There was an instant connection. His charisma, his skills in the ring, everything about him was so special. 
at WrestleMania 32, my gear was dedicated to him. I want people and little girls to feel how Eddie made me feel when I watched wrestling. I wanted to have an entrance with a car. Riding in style! Everything he did in the ring, I wanted to do. Sasha with a frog splash! I love Eddie Guerrero! He was so entertaining. It was so good that you had to get behind him. I was just a little girl being a fan, and now I'm doing everything I've ever dreamt of. Oh, look at this! Look at this! And Dana's been tossed out! Sasha paid homage to Eddie Guerrero with that move! His legacy is going to carry on forever. I hope I'm doing him justice. We then had the NXT Women's Championship match between Sasha Banks and Bayley. Now, people can be prone to hyperbole when they talk about a great match that they just saw. They could call it the greatest of all time, and maybe if they look back on it a few days later or a few weeks later, they kind of they kind of come back to reality. I guess time will tell if that happens here too, but I can honestly tell you as somebody who was in the building, who watched it live, this was, in my opinion, the greatest women's match, not only in the history of NXT, but in WWE history. I think it's safe to say that in the history of that company, so I'm not talking other companies, I'm not talking Japan, okay, don't jump down my throat, in terms of WWE or NXT, this was the greatest women's match that they've ever produced. Find me a better match. Find me a match that has... All of the elements that this one had going for it, the video package and the and the story leading up to the match, the entrances, especially Sasha's entrance, uh, the match itself, the psychology during the match with Bailey, you know, selling the injured hand, Sasha ripping the wrapping off of it and Bailey selling it, Sasha stomping on the hand. I thought that was a great moment in the match. Uh, the post match stuff when it was all over, the crowd reaction, everything, the whole package. There is no better women's match in the history of that company. And just as a match, okay, male or female, it's one of the greatest that I have ever seen live. I've been to a lot of shows. I've been to four WrestleManias now, five, whatever it's been. This is this is up there. This is up there as one of the greatest uh, matches that I have ever seen live. I'm, I'm so happy I was able to be there live to see this. And I know some people who went to the Ring of Honor show, and I heard the Ring of Honor show was actually very good, the one that they had at MCU Park. There were some people I heard from who were kicking themselves for going to the ROH show instead of uh, TakeOver, and, and kicking themselves for this match. Nothing else, just this match. And so I'm, I'm happy I made the choice to go and, and to be there for this, because to be in the building when Bailey won the championship was a special moment. Bailey did win the title from Sasha Banks. 18 minutes and 17 seconds is what I clocked it at. What can I say? I mean, <laughs> this was just fantastic. Uh, Sasha Banks coming out in the Escalade with the, you know, with the bodyguards was was a nice touch. It's not something that they've done for the women before. You know that that's really why I love this match so much. They treated this match like any other main event. They didn't treat it like a women's main event. They treated it like they would any other main event with the guys on even the main roster. As soon as they mentioned that Sasha's from Boston, that's the only point in the match where people vehemently booed this woman. <laughs> so no matter what she did, no matter how badly she beat up poor Bailey and stomped on her hand and did all this heinous stuff, the only time she ever got a truly negative reaction was when they mentioned Boston. When they got in the ring and they had the, uh, maybe my favorite sequence of the entire match is when uh, Sasha Banks got Bailey in the uh, bank statement, in the crossface. People are going nuts. And Bailey is reaching for the bottom rope. She's almost there, and Sasha starts stomping. She's using her legs, and she's stomping on Bailey's hand repeatedly, over and over and over again. And Bailey is still reaching for the ropes, and Sasha uses her own foot to push off the rope. So I thought what she was doing was she was trying to push the rope away so Bailey couldn't grab it, but she basically pushed off the rope, flipped over, and in doing so, Bailey was able to reverse it into a crossface of her own, and that's when people lost their shit. They were going absolutely crazy. Sasha, I think, was able to get her boot on the rope, and, and the ref broke it up. So the place was already going crazy. They were buzzing. I mean, there was a lot of really good stuff before this, too. They get to the end of the match, and they're up top on the uh, on the top rope, and Bailey goes 
and executes a reverse Rana off the top rope. It's a crazy move. It's a dangerous move when you're standing in the ring, when you're just standing on the mat. To do that from the top rope, and these are the women, so it's not something that you're used to seeing. It's not a risk that you're used to seeing the women, at least in WWE, take. They don't take high risks like that. And Bailey goes and she pulls off this this reverse Rana. Sasha looked like she landed on her head. It, it looked great. A little scary, but it looked great. And that was when you knew, okay, this is over. You you can't do a near fall here. <laughs> this match has to this has to end. And Bailey, sure enough, went for her belly to belly suplex, which I thought looked great. I always used to think that it was it was such a, a bad finisher because what is it? It's a belly to belly suplex, but she did this with such force uh, that it actually looked pretty damn uh, pretty damn good. And she got the pin. Everybody counted along. The place exploded when she won the championship. You look up at the screen. They zoomed in on Bailey. She was in tears, legit tears, just crying. I think. And by the way, she was not the only one crying. Okay, I I would be lying if I didn't tell you that you know it didn't even make me tear up a little bit. But there were people around who were legitimately crying, and people were. I have to say, you know, people were very emotional, whether they want to admit it or not. Uh, there were. There were quite a few of the uh, onion chopping ninjas running around the Barclay Center when Bailey won that title. You are on your deathbed, hopefully many years from now, and you are given the opportunity to watch one more wrestling match before you die. What are you choosing? Oh, God. I can't. I don't wish to betray Bret Hart like this. Truly, Ooh. truly, Ooh. I don't. But he is so, this is a Desert Island Discs philosophy, this. He is so ingrained in my mind palace that I wouldn't pick it because he's already there. He's there all the time. Okay. Heart matches are there when I close my eyes. So I'm going with Sasha Banks and Bailey from TakeOver Brooklyn. That's a great it's, shout. That's a really it's good It's a masterpiece. Shout. It's, in my opinion, probably the most important women's wrestling match in North American wrestling history, at least. Everything we're seeing in women's wrestling, I think, can be burst forth off that match. It's two of the best to ever do it. It stands up now. If anything, it's probably better now than it was then because as a genre, WWE have not taken enough care with women's wrestling and it shows what happens when you do. It's a credit to them. It was a credit to the time. It's even a credit to Triple H. Yeah, but this episode is not about Sasha Banks. As you may have noticed from the title, this episode is about Lulu Pencil. <laughs> and now this is some weird shit. Because I am not nearly the expert on Lulu Pencil that I am on Sasha Banks. It's amazing that I know who Lulu Pencil is at all. So Lulu Pencil is a Japanese wrestler. And Japan, it's such a strange duality where pro wrestling is way more segregated. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. The way they have things set up is... In most wrestling companies, there's one company that is all the men and one company that is all the women. So on the surface, that's maybe a step back from having everybody in the scrum together. But the upside to that is that these companies that are comprised entirely of female wrestlers are way more intricate and complicated than a lot of what goes on in North America just by the nature of everyone in the company is a woman. So there's multiple belts, there's tag belts, there's many different storylines happening, and it's all female wrestlers, where in North America, I don't know, do we have, I guess we do have some all-female companies, but it's very rare. Where in Japan, you have like New Japan Wrestling, and the same company owns Stardom Wrestling, and it's like, all right, which one do you want to watch? Do you want to watch the guys? Do you want to watch the girls? They're both fully fledged companies. So in that sense, female wrestling is way more accepted and way more integrated into their society. It's in a way, it's like it's not novel in Japan. The way it's like amazing in North America. Whoa, women's wrestling has risen up so much where in Japan it never had to. They've got this long tradition of female wrestling. But then again, <laughs> on the other other hand, because it's Japan, it's still a lot more sexualized and kind of weird than what we do in North America. Like, for instance, there's this wrestler, Hikaru Shida, who came over to America, 
works for AEW Wrestling, was their longest reigning women's champ, just kicks everyone's ass, is a total badass. But in Japan, you can buy a Blu-ray of her just in a bikini, you know, lounging around. Because that's just what you're expected to do in Japan. That's just part of the job. Where to like North American sensibilities, it's like, that doesn't make any sense. Hikaru Shida, the super badass who nobody can beat. Why would she have a bikini Blu-ray, <laughs> you know? But in Japan, they'd be like, why wouldn't she have a bikini Blu-ray? What kind of weirdo would not have a bikini Blu-ray? So, you know, it's just weird. Japan is just a weird place. Sometimes progressive, sometimes regressive, usually both at once. But Japan is the land of weird shit, you know? Like, I really don't think that can be overstated. I know we've had decades of like, oh, look at the weird stuff going on in Japan, but it's fucking true. And it couldn't be more true than in pro wrestling. In Japanese pro wrestling, you can get to the fringe of the fringe of the fringe of the fucking fringe. You can go so far down the line that this wrestler, Lulu Pencil, she wrestled for a company called Gato Pro. And Gato Pro doesn't have a wrestling ring. They put on shows in a small room where there's only enough room for one row of fans and instead of the ring, it's just mats they put on the floor. And they have a little back wall that's like a wall with a fucking window in it. You know, there's none of the throwing people into the ropes. The best you can do is you jump up on the windowsill and you do a move by leaping off the window. And it's just absurd. It's just absurd on the face of it. It's like, who would even have the gall to do this? <laughs> to put on these shows and to call this pro wrestling? Nobody, nobody in the fucking world would do this except Japan. Japan fucking loves it, and in Japan, in a cult way, it's popular. <laughs> it's like known. People know Gato Pro Wrestling. They know the people who wrestle there. In its own bizarre offshoot way, it's legitimate. It was started by this woman named Emi Sakura. I'll talk about her more at the very end. But yeah, it's just... Uh, you know, we don't have all the production. We don't have a big arena. We don't have a ring. We kind of don't have anything. But we got a camera. We got YouTube. Fuck it. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do wrestling. So it's really like... It's the most unrefined gems, you know? It's like this is the, the very, very start of wrestling. Is Gato Pro. You go here just to learn how to have a character, you know, or just how to perform in front of people, and to some extent how to do wrestling moves. But again, it's just mats on a floor in a tiny room. There's a limit to what's really possible here. But the most unrefined, the most very, very bottom of not just Gato Pro, but I mean, maybe all of wrestling. I can't think of anyone who it's like, I don't know, do you remember that old game Punch-Out? where the first person you fought was named Glass Joe, and it's just a play on Glass Jaw, and it was almost impossible to lose to Glass Joe. He's the first guy, you just beat him up to learn how to play Punch-Out. Lulu Pencil is the Glass Joe of wrestling. She was a journalist who got interested in pro wrestling and wanted to pursue it, but there's nobody less suited to being a wrestler than Lulu Pencil. This chick is so fucking skinny. <laughs> like, that's why they, like that's why they call her, <laughs> like that's why they call her Lulu Pencil because she's just pencil thin. Think of like olive oil. It's, it's like a cartoon how skinny this, this woman is. And she's not trying to bulk up. She's not trying to look like a wrestler. That's her character. She's Lulu Pencil. And she wears these overalls and this hat. Imagine like a pink Super Mario outfit. That's her outfit and she carries a pencil because she was a journalist and she calls her fans the pencil army and it's like this weird thing that it's like okay this journalist who is writing about wrestling or found out about wrestling and wants to see what wrestling's about. All right you know I guess it's like yeah it's like a, a fun weird joke character. Come on in do some weird stuff so you can write an article about wrestling. 
And the Lulu Pencil character is beyond absurd. Like, you know, there's a pretty long history in wrestling of, like, the underdog, the smaller guy, the young upstart. Even Sasha Banks herself is quite a slight person, you know, and it, it plays into how she wrestles. She has this flying double knee she does called the Meteora, because it's just like, that's what she needs to do to knock you down. She needs to just fly at you with everything she's got. Lulu Pencil is like half of a Sasha Banks. <laughs> Lulu Pencil... Like, they describe her attacks as, like, a determined leaf, you know? Like, when she leaps at you, it's nothing. It just does nothing. When she strikes people, she gets hurt. She hurts her own hand, <laughs> you know? When she puts people in wrestling holds, if she maneuvers them the wrong way so that the person's body weight falls on Lulu, Lulu has to tap out to her own move because she's like, Ah, you gotta get off me. I, I give up. I, I quit. I can't do it. It's so, it's just, it's so dumb. I don't even know what else to say. It's ludicrous. And again, it's the kind of thing that would really only happen in Japan. Like, do you ever watch, like, especially older, like, martial arts movies, but still to a certain extent now, maybe like Japanese horror movies, but do you ever watch these things and they seem a little corny, they seem a little over the top, a little overacted. It's definitely like that in pro wrestling, at all levels in Japan. If you're a Japanese wrestler who comes to America, one of the first things you need to learn is that you gotta tone it down. You gotta tone down the campiness because it just doesn't play in North America. Where in Japan, they have more of a tradition of that. Like, it's more accepted to be a sort of cartoonish character. But Lulu Pencil is cartoonish to the nth degree. I don't know how you could even devise a more ludicrous wrestler than Lulu Pencil. I mean, she hurts herself when she tries to hurt her opponent. It's, it's ridiculous. But it's just kind of like a fun story. And how I found out about Lulu Pencil are two YouTube videos in particular. The first one I saw was called Lulu Pencil Finding Strength in Weakness by the Joe Shizzle channel and the saga of Lulu Pencil by the Karen Watches Wrestling channel. And each of these videos has about 5,000 views. I was lucky I even found them at all. It's just like, this is again so deep down. As much as I watch whatever wrestling is around, I wasn't watching fucking Gato move, <laughs> you know? I think I kind of heard about it vaguely, like, oh, have you heard of that weird wrestling that they just do on the mat in the room in Shibuya? And it's like, okay, cool, man. <laughs> you know, like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with that, you know? But these channels, Joe Shizzle and Karen Watches Wrestling, they're both really good at breaking down Japanese wrestling and kind of explaining it to you and walking you through the storylines and translating stuff, which is nice. And the story of Lulu Pencil, I mean, basically, it's just that she managed to get this... The major storyline I know about is she managed to get this match with this guy, Chris Brooks, who is this British dude. He's like 6'5" just this really cool, handsome British guy who is twice the size of Lulu Pencil. But through the weird machinations of the fucking storyline, Lulu Pencil got a match with this guy, even though she'd never won a match ever. But she was really excited, like, he was the DDT champion. She's like, all right, I get a title match. And he's like, are you fucking high? I'm not putting my title on the line against you. It's insane that I'm even wrestling against you. Because, you know, he's smart enough to know, who knows, you know, weird surprise roll-up, strange fucking outside interference. What if? What if he somehow loses his belt to Lulu Pencil? So he's like, hey, I'll, I'll wrestle you. If you want to get beat up, that's fine with me. But I'm not putting my belt on the line. Get out of here, Lulu Pencil. So Lulu Pencil, being the brave good guy that she is... <laughs> She was like, well, we're not just going to have a match for, no, for nothing, you know? You're not willing to put up your, your belt? Well, I'm brave enough. I'll put up something important to me. I'll put up my hat, my pink hat that I always wear, that I love. We'll have a match for my hat. And Chris Brooks is like, okay, crazy, whatever. <laughs> whatever you want. And then Chris Brooks beat the shit out of her because of course he did. He's the fucking champ of this other company, and Lulu Pencil can't do anything. <laughs> so Chris Brooks wins, 
And that's what's great about that kind of corny overacting that they do in Japan. It's like the thing in North America now, now that everybody knows wrestling is fake and like we're all, uh, we're smart to how it works, we know how it works, we're the sophisticated fans, so we don't believe in good guys and bad guys anymore. It's all shades of gray for us. Not in Japan. In Japan, Lulu Pencil is the most brave hero you could ever want, in her own mind at least. <laughs> and Chris Brooks is the biggest asshole. He's a total fucking dick. So he was more than happy to take her hat and to just rub her nose in it. Like, ah, oh, your hat, your hat that you love. I don't love it. I don't even care. Fuck your hat. But you know what? You're never getting it back. You're never getting your hat back. And of course, Lulu Pencil could just go buy another hat, but that's not the point. The point isn't just to have a hat. It's that hat. That's her hat. And this turned into like a months long odyssey of Lulu Pencil trying to fight to get back her hat. And she never could because she could never win. She could barely hurt anyone ever. If she was really lucky, she might get somebody in like a proper hold once in a while. <laughs> but, but that's it. And it escalated to the point where Chris Brooks was like, all you got to do is quit. I'll give you back your hat. Just quit. But Lulu Pencil would not quit. And she lost. <laughs> and how it eventually all culminated is just Chris Brooks it just got tired of it. He's like, all right, whatever. Whatever. I am sick of this. You won't quit. You won't give up. Here's your fucking hat. Take your goddamn hat, Lulu Pencil. I'm fucking sick of this shit. And really, that's it. That's the story of Lulu Pencil. It's so fucking stupid. It's so dumb. <laughs> but it's like so awesome because it's so dumb. It's just like, man, this is what is so great about pro wrestling being fake is you make up the story, you know, you make up the tale. But there's no tale more ludicrous, more like unbalanced of like, more of a courageous good guy who has no fucking right to ever believe that they should be so courageous. But you could never have someone more determined than Lulu Pencil, yet more pathetic. Only in a fake sport could you ever get away with someone just completely inept at the sport, taking part in all these matches. And you can never have someone who's more of a unrepentant, piece of shit than this guy Chris Brooks but it was just so cool and so entertaining and I just thought it was so neat like the real life story the real life woman who was a journalist who wanted to get into pro wrestling and she got into pro wrestling on the fringe of the fringe of the fringe of the fringe in Gato Pro and even in Gato Pro where there's not a proper ring she was bottom of the pecking order by a lot but I thought, oh, that's just neat. You know, I saw these YouTube videos two or three months ago, and it's just like, you know, floating around in my brain. The story of Lulu Pencil, oh, that's cool. And then recently, Emi Sakura came over to America to work at AEW, and Lulu Pencil is with her. It's like, uh, Emi Sakura has this kind of regal character, and Lulu Pencil is now her page, kind of her retainer, is not not the traditional Lulu Pencil character anymore, but it's like, oh, that's cool too, <laughs> you know? Lulu Pencil got to move to America and now works at this big wrestling company and is on the fringe of the fringe of the fringe of this wrestling company, but she's here. Her dream of wrestling is going somewhere. That's just cool. But what really got me and why I decided to do this episode is I was just listening to a podcast. It's Chris Jericho, who's been a pretty famous pro wrestler for the last three decades, you know. And he did a podcast about the Pro Wrestling Insider Top 500. Every year this magazine, Pro Wrestling Insider, puts out their list of the top 500 wrestlers in the world. And what's kind of neat about this list is that they don't look at it from the, oh, sophisticated, smart fan perspective of like, oh, well, this guy, look how crisp his moves are, and look at how good his work rate is, and look at all these sort of stale things about the art of wrestling, they look at it more like as if you were eight years old. Like who is the biggest, coolest guy who has been the champ for the longest? Then that's number one, <laughs> you know? It's like 
I mean, it's a fake sport, so why not have a, a completely fake list, right? Like the list of who would a 10 year old think were the top 500 wrestlers in the world is kind of the approach. But what's interesting about the Pro Wrestling Insider top 500 is everybody pays attention to the top 10. If you can make it in the top 10, that's pretty cool. But then 500 fucking wrestlers, who can pay attention to 500 wrestlers? You know, at that point, it's probably only interesting to the wrestler themselves. <laughs> if you're anywhere between 100 and 500, you know, no one's really paying attention, no one cares. But what they do care about, what people do check is who's number 500? Because that's just an easy thing to check and it's just interesting. Like, who is the last person on the list? Who just barely made it? So, being number 500 is essentially being number 11. Because that's what everybody does. They look at the top 10, all the wrestling news sites report the top 10, and number 500. Because people are just interested. Who's number 500? And I was just listening to this podcast, and they're going down the list, and they're like, Jericho's like, number 500, Lulu Pencil. Who the hell is Lulu Pencil? And I was just excited that I knew who Lulu Pencil was. Because, <laughs> you know, even with the amount of wrestling that I kind of haphazardly absorb, it was just lucky that I ever heard of Lulu Pencil. It was, like, amazing that I knew who this person was. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I know who Lulu Pencil is. And it's very telling that even though Lulu Pencil works for the company Chris Jericho is in, he didn't know who she was. He had no fucking idea. He's like, she works for AEW? What? All right. <laughs> if you say so. But as I listened to that bit, and as I listened to the two guys from the magazine describe this story of Lulu Pencil and all of the fans Lulu Pencil has, and that they did this special cover, if you want to get the Lulu Pencil cover, because she's number 500, you can. And I got like a lump in my throat. I didn't expect it at all. It's like, man, that's fucking awesome. That is so cool. Because it's just such a great story of the same way I was saying with Sasha Banks and Bailey and that whole generation of women's wrestlers that they just had to believe. You know, they just had to have faith. They just had to see their dream in the distance and work toward it and just hope. Just hope that they were going to make it there, even though there was nowhere to get to when they started the journey. And if they had not had that bravery, all of the amazing stuff they accomplished couldn't have happened, you know? Such an inspirational story. And Lulu Pencil... The same fucking thing of just, it's so bizarre. It's so crazy that Lulu Pencil decided, you know, I want to be a wrestler, but not just as a lark, you know, again, not just once or twice so she could write an article about it. She went full on into it. She wrestled a bunch of matches. She had these epic storylines that went over like the year. And she got to move to America, and she's in AEW now, and who knows if she'll ever make it onto the show proper. At this point, like I said, she's just Emi Sakura's page, you know? She's just the person who holds Emi Sakura's robes. But, but she's poised. She's there, you know? It's such a different situation from Sasha and Bailey, but they were poised. They were ready. They were ready that as soon as the landscape changed, and as soon as it was time to strike to move to that next level. They were there and they were ready. And in her own weird way, Lulu Pencil is there too. But I guess what kind of put the lump in my throat is just that she's number 500 on the Pro Wrestling Insider top 500 list. Like, this isn't just the weird room in Shibuya. This isn't just the weird Gato Pro YouTube channel. This isn't just the bizarre little story that indie wrestling fans in Japan know, or that the occasional North American, if you're lucky, you stumble upon this story and you get to learn about it. The Pro Wrestling Insider list, they've been doing this thing for 30 years. Everybody remembers these lists. People go back and check them. And what they check is who was 1 to 10 and who was 500. And now forever. I mean, it's it's weird to say on the global stage because the globe doesn't care about wrestling. People in general don't care about wrestling. But wrestling fans fucking care about wrestling. And wrestling fans care about this list. 
and it's like the spotlight of the world shown on on Lulu pencil. <laughs> it's like choking me up now to think about it. It's just so it's so fucking cool. It's so awesome to be legitimized like that for just for throwing yourself head first, headlong into your dream. No matter how weird your dream is, no matter how strange it is, no matter how impossible it is, you know, even in the fake scripted storyline world of wrestling, there is zero fucking chance for Lulu fucking pencil to be recognized, to be popular, to go anywhere. Even in wrestling, this makes no sense. But because she did it, because she just went for it, and put everything she had into it and worked and worked and worked at it and she made the list she made the 500 spot one of the best spots to make you know and even if it's just for this moment even if the AEW connection never goes anywhere and even if the Lulu pencil character just ends up going back to Japan and just continuing to be this really cult thing for at least this moment the Chris Jericho's of the world and everybody listening to his podcast go, who the hell is Lulu Pencil? <laughs> you know? And they get to hear this story. And I just fucking love that so much. Just to be corny and to be over the top about it. It's just do the thing, you know? Whatever your weird dream is, just fucking do it. Just fucking do it, man. I mean, especially now in this world with the internet and with everything being interconnected, that's what made this possible, that they could just do a weird wrestling show in a fucking spare room and put it on YouTube and reach these levels. In the most respectful way, there's nothing stupider than the Lulu Pencil story. There's nothing dumber than this example. It's the dumbest thing to want to do. It's the dumbest thing to think you ever could achieve. But that doesn't matter in this world. In this world, there's nothing that can stop you anymore. There's no fucking barriers. You can just decide, you know what? I'm, I am the last person who should be a pro wrestler. And I'm going to play the character who even my character is the last person that should be a pro wrestler. Nothing about this makes sense. There's no reason why this should work. But I'm just going to put fucking everything into it. And maybe I'll make it to that point where I'm fucking immortalized. I'm on the list. I'm number 500. I just think that's so fucking cool. So whatever it is you want to do, man, just think of fucking Lulu Pencil. Go watch those videos on YouTube. Finding Strength in Weakness and the Saga of Lulu Pencil. The Joe Shizzle channel and the Karen Watches Wrestling channel. And again, I know it's trite, I know it's, it's like a cliche, but man, if fucking Lulu Pencil can do it, you can fucking do it. I don't recommend you try to become a pro wrestler who can't hurt anybody. I don't think you can do that again. I think Lulu Pencil sewed up the market on that one. But whatever your dream is, man, there is literally no reason why you can't do it. It doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense and it doesn't matter if you're aiming at a target that doesn't exist because the mechanisms of the world are so random and so bizarre that things that don't make sense might start to make sense as you work toward them. And you could throw the dart at nothing and the target could appear in mid-flight. That's just the world we're in now. There's no excuse not to do it. Whatever it is, you can fucking do that shit. <laughs> She is a very good established freelance writer. She was fascinated by professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. So Lulu Pencil is quite uh, like a tall woman, but she is very weak, like there's just bones in her. But Amy Sakura, as you all know, the mad genius, made her a wrestler. Like it's okay if you are weak, you can just find new ways to win. Because Chris Brooks gotta be Chris Brooks, he rubbed the result of the match in Lulu's face, reminding her that he'll always win and she'll always lose, because that's reality. In his eyes, Lulu was living a fantasy, believing that she could win, because 
she's not a professional wrestler. She's simply a writer and that's all she's ever gonna be. Chris's words to Lulu were scathing, but Emi and Minoru reminded Lulu that they still believe in her and know that one day she will defeat Chris, but it is all up to her. However, while Lulu still held on to her belief, she admitted that just because she's not wrong about how she feels doesn't mean that Chris is wrong either. Lulu Pencil continued moving forward, but her defeat against Chris Brooks made a considerable impression on her. Poor Lulu was a broken pencil, but even a broken pencil can turn into a new pencil. Wherever her path leads her next, it's sure to circle back to Chris Brooks. And maybe that will be the moment Lulu finally wins. Until then, we wait and watch. Lulu has expressed that one day she wants to write about her experiences as a professional wrestler and especially reach out to those who don't know what Joshi wrestling is so that more people can understand what it's about and maybe start watching. And I think that would be such a great idea because Lulu is such an atypical wrestler to me. You know, she doesn't fit the mold of a professional wrestler, even more so than other wrestlers who don't fit the mold. So anybody out there who has dreams of becoming a professional wrestler, but they feel like they don't fit in or that they can't do what wrestlers do, they can look at Lulu and say, hey, if she can do it, then I can do it. I think that's part of the appeal of Lulu Pencil and why she endears herself to so many fans. She is the quintessential underdog. She looks like she doesn't belong. She struggles. She can't win matches, but she keeps trying and she keeps wanting to do her best. She constantly loses, but she refuses to let those losses get her down. She refuses to give up. I know that I learned some valuable lessons from Lulu Pencil and I hope you did too. This is the only one hat in the world. Sakura san, the first This is my treasure. The story of Lulu Pencil and her hat show that you don't need a grand stage or a world title to make a match compelling. You can be considered a bad wrestler, but if you present yourself honestly, people can still look past that and rally behind you. This is not the end of Lulu's journey, and myself and many fans await the day that she will get her first victory. So that was the hopefully inspirational tale of Lulu Pencil, and I just want to end with this little clip from the Karen Watches Wrestling channel. Even though I didn't talk much about Emi Sakura, the fact that she started Gato Pro and started all these different wrestling organizations and really helped women's wrestling and that's mainly why she's in AEW now is to help their women's wrestling division. And I just thought this was a really nice clip from like a tribute that Karen did about Emi Sakura and about her time when she started trying to get into wrestling and was really just discouraged and demoralized and just how much she wishes there'd been somebody like Emi Sakura in her life, you know, someone who will take Lulu Pencil under her wing. She'll take anybody who has the drive and the desire to succeed and she'll fucking believe in them. And I just thought this was a nice little clip. Yo, if I make it through this video without crying, it'll be a miracle. What's up, everybody? My name is Karen and I watch wrestling. I'm learning more about Japanese wrestling and the woman who created the most joyous experience in wrestling right now is leaving for America. That's right. I'm talking about the one, the only, Emi Sakura. On July 24th, Emi Sakura announced that she had bought a one-way ticket to America to join AEW full-time, and she was gonna make a statement in the women's division. So you can imagine that a lot of people were excited, but also sad because this meant that Emi Sakura was leaving Chaco Pro and Gato Move, the very institutions that she created and built. It's gonna feel really weird to have Emi not be a part of that, but 
things in life grow and they change and I know everybody at Choco Pro is going to do a tremendous job of taking over the reins. Now for anybody who doesn't know, who is Emi Sakura? She began her wrestling career in 1994 at the age of 17 and by 2006 she founded her own Joshi wrestling promotion known as Ice Ribbon. Emi Sakura has won several championships with the promotion and in 2009, Tokyo Sports named her Joshi Wrestler of the Year. Not only was Emi a wrestler in Ice Ribbon, she was also its trainer. However, she left in 2012. But this did lead to the formation of Gato Move although it was originally called Bangkok Girls Pro Wrestling. Yes, it started in Bangkok, Thailand after Emmy had moved there and learned there were a lot of wrestling fans in Thailand, but no promotions. So Emmy Sakura created the first wrestling promotion in Thailand. It wasn't until a few months later that the promotion changed its name to Gato Move Pro Wrestling, which is how we know it today. Unfortunately, while Gato Move continues to thrive in Japan, the original branch in Thailand did close down in 2019, but the indie promotion scene there has grown and continues to thrive. The reason that I wanted to make this video is because anybody who follows Emi Sakura can see the impact that she has had on Joshi wrestling. When I look at Joshi today, I think that one of the biggest imprints that has been made on Joshi wrestling is from Emi Sakura. When you look at the women that Emi has trained, Riho, Hikaru Shida, Mei Suruga, the talent and ability between all three of them is undeniable. And Emi nurtured that. And it's not just them, it's all of the women that Emi has trained. Emi Sakura produces terrific talent. And according to Emmy herself, she doesn't even know how many Joshi wrestlers she's trained, but she estimates that it is in the hundreds. So all of Emmy's influence is spread across the Joshi world. One of the reasons why I love Emmy Sakura and why I wish I could meet her in another lifetime is because she believes that wrestling is for everybody and that anybody can become a pro wrestler. Emmy's philosophy is why Lulu Pencil is so significant. Emmy herself was denied and told that she wasn't talented enough when she first tried to become a professional wrestler. And here she is today with her own wrestling school, Dare Demo Joshi Pro Wrestling, where anybody can learn pro wrestling. Women and girls from all walks of life, whether they be an engineer, a pop idol, a housewife, or even a freelance writer. That is Emi Sakura's legacy, and quite frankly, it's a philosophy we need more of in pro wrestling. So a little known fact about me, I trained to be a wrestler at one point, and to make a long story short, it didn't work out. But I wish there was a school like the one Emi has had existed for me back then. You know, I wish that I had a teacher like Emi Sakura in my life. Maybe my life would have turned out in a far better way if so. <laughs> That is the impact that Emi Sakura has on wrestlers and on fans. And to quote Emi herself, fans are the most important people in this business. So I hope this personal account sheds some light on the significance and greatness of Emi Sakura to those of you who are unfamiliar with her. Do yourself a favor and watch Emi's final Choco Pro match against her star pupil, Mei Surtiga and be sure to check her out when she joins AEW. I made it through, I didn't cry, I almost came close one time. Yo, a little postscript to this episode. I'm back at the uh, little mini waterfall. So sometimes I record stuff for an episode and uh, then it takes me a little while to get around to putting out the episode. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing how fast time can fly. I just saw the little notification that the new Pro Wrestling Insider Top fucking 100 just came out. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my god. That was a year ago that I recorded that episode. I think that's a good sign that it's time <laughs> to get this thing out. But since I dragged my heels a little, I can give an update about where Lulu Pencil and Sasha Banks are now. Oh, and I should mention too that uh, I got the names wrong when I was talking about Lulu Pencil. The overall company she worked for was called 
Gateau Move. And this specific show that took place in the little room with the mat was called Choco Pro. So I was conflating those names together. But that's a good example of, uh, I mean, I honestly hardly knew what I was talking about because it was like a, a sign of the power of Lulu Pencil that I never really paid attention to Choco Pro before or Gato Move in general. And I still kind of don't, <laughs> you know? I kind of keep half an eye on it. But it was the story of Lulu Pencil that got me interested in this thing. And uh, without Lulu Pencil, the rest of it don't hit the same, you know? But anyway, yeah, I got those names mixed up. So Lulu Pencil, as I mentioned, moved to America and uh, was in AEW wrestling. And she was like the valet to Emi Sakura, who was her main trainer. And I was like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen from here, you know? Because she was only appearing on kind of the B shows, not the major shows. And she wasn't one of the major wrestlers. She was just a, a side character. And she wasn't even the Lulu Pencil character. She was dressed kind of like a, a royal court page. But anyway, basically it didn't really go anywhere. It turns out uh, what they ended up doing is taking different wrestlers from Choco Pro and cycling them all in. So Lulu was there for about three months and then they brought in someone else and then they brought in someone else, you know, just so they can get a taste. Get a taste of America, get a taste of uh, how big time wrestling works outside of Japan. And then after that, Lulu Pencil has just kind of disappeared. She didn't go back to Choco Pro, which does make sense because she had this, this epic battle with Chris Brooks over her hat, you know, it was like in its own silly way. It was the coolest thing that could happen. How that ended, by the way, is uh, she actually managed to, in like an hour long Iron Man match against Chris Brooks, the way the match worked is who can pin the other person the most times in an hour. So, I mean, Lulu got pinned over and over and over and over, but one time, right at the end, right before the time was up, she managed to legitimately pin Chris Brooks one time. And that was like, that was enough for Chris Brooks to tell her she was a wrestler. And it was like, it was nice. It was a nice moment. But it's like, yeah, you're not going to top that. It was this weird phenomenon that happened the one time. It would be weird to go back to wrestling in the little room with the mat. So she didn't, presumably, because she was a journalist in the first place. I assume she's working on her book right now. She's probably writing the story of this whole thing. And going to America is kind of like the cherry on top. They're like, wow, I can't believe it. What a weird way for this. You know, I just wanted to see what pro wrestling was like. And I went way further than I ever thought I would. So presumably that's what Lulu Pencil is working on for now. You got to assume her days in wrestling are probably done. <laughs> but again, what a great story. Just so cool. And Sasha Banks, as of this recording, who knows, her days of wrestling might be done too. Basically, when she was in NXT, that's that, you know, talking about these amazing matches that she had and just how awesome things were going. NXT was the developmental side brand of WWE. It was run by a guy named Paul Levesque, who did an excellent job. People have said, like, he's probably the best booker of female wrestling in North American history. And it's kind of like he didn't do anything special. He just treated it like normal wrestling. <laughs> you know, That's how sad the state of female wrestling, like I said last year, that's how sad it was in North America. All you had to do was just cut the bullshit and then it can be great. But he's the only one who would fucking do that. So after Sasha's time in developmental ended and she went up to the main roster that's the main WWE and I mean it's just a shit show it's just a terrible show run by Vince McMahon the big famous fucking WWE guy who's just an old misogynist idiot like he's he's fucking sucked on every level that you can suck and just after years of just being misused and of just dumb bullshit happening over and over, Sasha left. She walked out. She was like, I fucking had it. She was, I think, tag team champ at the time with this woman named Naomi. If I remember the story right, they just like dropped off the belts in the office and were like, here you go. Take your belts. We're fucking out of here. This is enough of this bullshit. 
And then in the time that she's been gone, Vince McMahon had to step down from his own company in public disgrace due to a sex scandal. That's, that's you know, it's little wonder this guy was not good. He wasn't good at booking wrestling anyway, but he was especially bad at booking women's wrestling. And all that stuff I was talking about before, you know, how wrestling used to be in the 90s and the 2000s with like whipped cream matches and bikini matches. I mean, this is the guy. This is why. It's the least surprising reason for him to fucking step down there could ever be. Good riddance, you know? So now that he's gone, Paul Levesque, that guy who did such a good job in NXT, he took over WWE. So it's like, now maybe? Maybe Sasha will come back? Things will certainly be better if she does. I mean, they couldn't have been worse, but you know, I'm feeling pretty good now about North American wrestling. I think it's gonna get better. It's gonna be less embarrassing. I mean, it's still going to be wrestling, it's still going to be dumb. If you're not into it, you're still not going to be into it. But it will definitely be better. However, whether Sasha Banks will come back or not, who knows? She's doing all kinds of other stuff. She's an actor, she's a singer, she does all kinds of shit. And kind of like with Lulu Pencil, like, do you, you know, do you need to go back? Wrestling's a weird job. Like, obviously, legitimate combat sports are way more brutal and you get beat up way worse. But wrestling's in this weird spot where because it's performative, because it's a work, you know, it's just a show. That means you don't have one fight every four months. That means you might have to go do a fake wrestling match four times a week. And it just beats you down because you're, you know, there's a limit to how much you can fake it. It's basically you're doing like a fight scene from a movie over and over and over and it just destroys your body. Wrestlers, when they retire, are not in good shape. So I would, uh, I would be fine if Sasha Banks never comes back. It might be the best choice. I don't know if I would if I was her, but at least if she does come back at this point, things are in a better place than they were. So I hope you found this interesting. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next time. The 500 spot. Uh, this is always the uh, much discussed position to be in. This year, it is uh, Lulu Pencil. Mm -hmm. And I had no freaking idea who Lulu Pencil is, except for now I think she's an AW, maybe? Something. She's <laughs> <in a company laughs> I didn't need your coworker. <laughs> Everybody's an AEW. That's the thing. It's, it's, they, get, they, they snatch up Lulu the, the best Lulu Pencil's wrestlers. an AW. Who the hell is Lulu Pencil? <laughs>